Thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. So we are MuleSoft. So let's actually put the next one. So my name is Ada Vesteren. I'm an architect. So sorry, I'm an enterprise architect by background. Been 26 years actually in IT, hate computers. But it's going to be heavy with architecture in the beginning. And uh, there's going to be some hand waving, although I promise I will not say digital disruption. And uh, with me today is Anton Kravchenko from our headquarters in uh, San Francisco. So actually he's going to do some uh, real techie stuff. So we will do demonstration actually on a live, live integration platform doing uh, PSD2 APIs, right? Yeah, so actually built you PSD2 solution right now here. Uh, Power of Design is the title of the presentation. So actually it's more about the API design, so not industrial design or graphical design. And as I said, I'm going to go pretty much into architecture. Uh, especially as uh, Anton is here, please be interactive. So you got uh, actually product manager from our development in California, so make comments, uh, whatever you want. A disclaimer, so whatever what we will be saying or doing or promising might happen or might not happen. Um, the title, the design, I was thinking about this one, so it's uh, related to challenge that usually we are pretty good designing things and solutions for short term, but uh, not very good for long term. So that's the, that's the red thread of my presentation. So what, what can we do? when there's so much things changing, there's so much uncertainty as well, how can we build solutions and platforms, IT platforms that will support business in a very changing environment? Because it's a crazy train right now, and uh, all these two days about it as well. Everybody's talking about inno innovation, especially in FinTech. So everything's going to be disrupted. Uh, there's new technologies coming all the time. How, uh, what's the kind of magic bullet? Nobody really knows exactly, and even, even with PSD2 open banking, so we don't exactly know plenty of details yet. Well, blockchain, that's always a good candidate for solving everything and making innovation. Then the situation is about here. So, so I just read some, some posts about saying that it's a, we are living in a third wave of the FinTech revolution. So the first uh, wave, was that uh, all these fintech startups started offering new innovative services or maybe replacing traditional services with better uh, cost efficiency and uh, better user experience for, for consumers. Second way was then that uh, the incumbent banks realized that this is happening and started looking into that. And the third way then is described as incumbent banks actually and also the fintech startups starting to make an e ecosystem together and actually, in this very same town, there is a sandbox environment uh, available for anybody with big pockets um, that you can start uh, just with buying the platform, an API-driven banking platform, um, retail, uh, business, uh, investment, and then you can just choose as well if you want to use some of the fintech uh, systems for that one. You can integrate those as part of the portfolio. How many of you actually saw this um, Starling Bank presentation? Yeah. So that's exactly where things are going. Uh, so either you can be a, a challenger bank. We are working with one, not Starling, but another challenger bank as well. So you start from scratch, build everything uh, anew. Or then uh, some incumbent banks, basically, they, they start a new virtual brand, maybe totally virtual, virtual version, and build a new platform on that one. Or then the third option for incumbent banks usually is that uh, you start changing your IT infrastructure to support this kind of thing. But it's clearly that the industry is going for this kind of uh, API-driven banking as a platform. That's where basically everybody is, uh, is moving and thinking. But then, when you look inside, especially the incumbent banks, so you have been developing great projects, uh, one of solutions, unfortunately, quite often, uh, not thinking about the big picture. And on longer term, it's heading for a probable disaster. As well, the foundation might not be so solid. So there's plenty of uh, not only banking, other industries as well, but banks are pretty notorious that they have this 
strange boxes in the corner. Uh, the guy who developed the system retired 10 years ago, and uh, there hasn't been spare parts for those uh, that box for the last five years. So if, that, uh, if the smoke comes out from that one, nobody knows what's going to happen. It's going to be a disaster. So there's uh, lots of challenges in the industry. And uh, how many of you have your budget going up all the time? That you just get more money to do more nice, nice stuff? Hands up. I don't see any hands. Yeah, that's the reality. So the budgets are going down. And because of these uh, challenges, actually, you have to spend more and more. It used to be 80% is spent on keeping the lights on. But in the worst cases, nowadays, it's 95% uh, it's of the core IT, central IT budget is spent on keeping the lights on. That, and then you get all the innov innovation, all the new technology, all the competition, FinDex, etc. So something should be done. And what we at Mulesoft and uh, our experience with plenty of customers around the world, plenty of banks as well, uh, have come across. So success doesn't come only with technology. It's also about the architectural approach and how, do you, how you do development. Only those three factors can bridge that gap that you need to bridge. And actually, there's a Gartner white paper out from last March that's uh, worth uh, 20,000 pounds of knowledge or something in very condensed form, how you can do it. So it's a technology platform, API-led connectivity and uh, center for enablement. So I will walk you briefly through this approach as a background, high-level background, how things should be done nowadays if you want to achieve this kind of uh, IT landscape. Very briefly about platform design. So First of all, deployment uh, freedom, on-prem cloud hybrid especially. So banks traditionally have been bound uh, to on-prem only, but uh, definitely everybody is looking for cloud deployment and especially the chal challenger banks are going for cloud as soon as it's uh, po possible from the regulation perspective. Uh, technological diversity, especially incumbent banks again, so you have to support your mainframes, your long-term legacy, together with the late, latest digital innovation. So you have to be able to connect maybe like traditional web services, uh, mainframe queues, uh, most modern APIs as well, all of that in a single platform if you want to succeed as well. Architectural pattern flexibility, so we are mostly talking about APIs here. But APIs uh, themselves, it's a, it's a pattern, more modern SOA pattern. Microservices, one specific pattern of that one. But uh, in a heterogeneous environment, complex environment, you want to support multiple number of patterns. You don't want to restrict yourself to only one, like microservices APIs uh, for external use. But you want to have an IT platform that supports all kind of architectural patterns. <coughs> And uh, what we talk, uh, how many of you saw Danny Healy's presentation earlier this morning? Yeah. So I think he was talking more about application network. I'll just mention that this is our vision at MuleSoft. So what, what modern companies and enterprises especially want to build is an application network. So a flexible platform that works on all deployment uh, possibilities, on-prem cloud seamlessly. You can plug in and out uh, legacy systems uh, modern systems, create new business processes, create new user experiences very flexibly by exposing everything with the standard uniform APIs and integration interfaces. That's where you should be heading at. Then the second element, architecture design. What kind of architecture do you need, need then for this modern IT landscape? Uh, you got lots of uh, an ever-growing number of uh, data processes, uh, systems, uh, new audiences, especially new channels. You want to shoot up a totally mobile banking platform, uh, some probably new channels coming after some years. You have to make sense of all this and make it work together if you want to thrive. And uh, here's a healthy advice. You don't want to be here, ending up here. And uh, if you just go, and take the latest idea always and uh, make a one-off project with the lowest TCO, uh, you will end up with this uh, integration and dependency spaghetti. That's a lot of, a lot of the legacy companies especially have this as a problem. And this is what you need to, you don't want to go, the, 
go there, it's been tested already for decades, and uh, that's a nightmare. And that's the road where you be spending 90% of your budget just keeping the lights on. This is the core of the IP that uh, we at Meals of the talk with all the all the customers, and this is actually kind of a extracted from the successful customers, how to do integration and APIs. So it's kind of a modern version of the traditional SOA architecture. You have three layers of uh, APIs. So system APIs is an abstraction layer for your backend services, your backend data, your digital assets. So you don't want to go directly to your backend uh, systems. You don't want to tie especially your end, user, end users, your customers, your experience with the uh, backend systems directly, because that's the uh, end result will be from that one that after, after 10, 20 years, your foundation will be rotten. So this is the way how you, how you avoid this situation. Experience APIs is a specific API role for uh, the consumers, end consumers, and uh, customers, clients of your services, all your digital assets and services. And uh, they are similar in an abstraction layer for the technical dependencies and, uh, and making the best possible cu customer experience for that use case on that device, on that channel. And they isolate, they first of all optimize your services for those consumers and those channels, but they also isolate any technological needs or functional needs coming from that experience, that technological channel, to the rest of your reusable, reusable API architecture. Then the actual business uh, knowledge and business operations are process APIs. So the middle layer is the business knowledge. And actually, if you take a look at the uh, ownership as well, you see line of business IT should own, develop, and operate these process APIs. And these should be the generic things that you are doing, like uh, <clears throat> fetching your uh, personal information for the bank, fetching your transaction uh, account transaction data, making payments, initiating payments, confirming payments, uh, fraud management, these kind of things as a generic layer to be reused by multiple number of experienced APIs publishing use cases through different channels. Central IT normally uh, owns the system APIs because they know what you need in that domain is knowledge, what digital assets, what backend systems you have and how to connect to those. So it's more technical role of the APIs. Uh, the innovation teams usually own the experience API. So it could be like one customer, Coca-Cola is sponsoring events every week in USA. So actually they develop a new mobile app every week. So there's gonna be a new team coming in, developing the mobile app, developing some APIs as well around that. And it's, uh, this is the fast IT. So it can be seen as well, if you know the Gartner's uh, fast and slow IT. So this is the slow mode one IT, and this is the fast mode two IT. Then important part of this, and how to bridge the gap, is the C4E here. So actually, we advocate strongly that you don't do API development or integration development in the traditional mode of integration competence center or center of excellence. So we call it C4E, Center for Enablement. And the role of that one is that it starts usually with central IT, creating templates, uh, project accelerators, API best practices to a shared repository. So we call it Exchange. It's basically a web portal accessible through a browser or then from development uh, tools and also the platform tools themselves. So this is the starting of best practice, how API development management should be done in the organization. And then the actual projects start their development. And uh, as a first step, they should always go and see what's published. So this is how you promote reuse, because reuse is at the core of bringing pr productivity, improving the productivity of, uh, of development in IT. Is there an asset? At least there should be some, some project template, maybe that's even reusable asset that can be used uh, straight away as an API. So actually that's an API directory, API catalog as well in that sense. Or then if one doesn't exist yet, 
then there should be some kind of template, best practice documentation, how it should be done. And it's going to be so, so much easier for the developer to take that one and start customizing for their needs than starting the development from scratch. And it's also a two-way two -way train. So maybe in the project, uh, there's something that would be of free use for other projects or corporate-wide. So they should be then promoting those things back to the repository to be shared with everybody again. So this is the uh, core idea of C4E, Center for Enablement, not trying to control the development. So letting go of control, letting basically anybody in the organization to do the development, but still as uh, IT should try to control the quality, governance, security, etc. So trying to enforce those through those reusable assets. So maybe having, having an API a template that includes already the corporate security policies, etc. So trying to guide the development through this one. There could be some review processes, etc. Uh, so this is the people process part, which is always the most difficult one and easiest to fail. Going down in technologies so of the actual API design. So that's very important part. Uh, what would be the reasons when you start uh, creating APIs and publishing those, why they don't get used? Why nobody actually uses your APIs? What would be the three biggest reasons for that? Bad experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually nobody can find them. So the three biggest problems are that actually, even after finding it and, uh, and uh, reading the documentation or description of it, it actually doesn't behave as expected. Uh, it's hard to understand. So you find it, but it's difficult to understand what's actually it's doing. And then naturally, if nobody has heard, heard of it, nobody's going to use it either. So these are the three biggest challenges when you create APIs and want to promote reusability and your API economy with the external developers as well. So the solutions from our point of view are, first of all, make the APIs discoverable. Uh, so we have the exchange, for instance, as an as a API catalog, have a place where people can go and look and have something, so I'm coming back to that something, uh, that is the shared information, the API contract. And then uh, to learn how to use it, so have the API portals, tutorials, and have a clear human readable API contract as well, how, it is, how is it used. Then to ensure that the, the API will do what is expected by reading the documentation and the API contract as well. So it, this is actually the API first development approach. So you should stick to the definition. So what you want and what actually provides all these needs is a API contract in some form. So we are crazy over RAML, RESTful API markup language. There's two others, Swagger and API Blueprint. So it's basically depending on your platform and uh, and uh, choices you can choose between each other. We, we have been always thinking that Trammel is the best one, uh, but we do have a, on the roadmap, roadmap I heard that we will support Swagger in the future as well. But that's most important thing, have an API contract. Because first of all, that will be the asset that you publish so that people can find it. So it's very simple. And the same asset will describe. So have a powerful markup language that, that can describe human readable what resources you are publishing, how they are accessed, and what you get back. And then the last problem, so that actually the implementation does what the API contract describes, so stick to spec-driven, specification-driven development. So there's two different stages for API development. There's the design phase and there's the development phase. So the design phase should be the agile part. So Take your end users, uh, take your use case, innovate, uh, try to engage them, tr test with them, and uh, design the API contract itself. And because uh, you should be able to mock only with the API contract, you don't, 
you don't need to do any development yet. So just uh, mock up chains, test with your future consumers, find the best possible and contract that promotes reusability as well, because that's what you are aiming for with APIs as well. Understand why you do it, think long term, not just today, but try to think long term. Unfortunately, it's not very easy uh, because we can't anticipate future very well. But uh, keeping it simple, actually the last house rule helps there. The fancier you get, uh, the poorer reusability you probably will have with time. So try to keep it simple and generic. Otherwise, there's a number of other best practices how you should design APIs. And actually, I think, yeah, so if you want, we have actually, actually a book on this one, The Undisturbed Rest. So that's uh, going into depth uh, for the best practices in API design on generic level also. So Simon there on the back row will be happy to give you some if you want. You can find it a uh, free ebook as well from our website. Anyway, the design part, be agile, be fast, fail fast, try to make the best possible experience and reusability for the API. But then after the spec is fixed, you go to development mode and do the development according to the spec. Don't innovate anymore, don't be agile, because you will break the contract if you do that. So implement the actual implementation of the service according to the contract. So try to divide it in these two phases. Innovate first with the contract, and after the contract is fixed, then just implement the contract. And it's kind of a, so the development itself, it's a chop down in our philosophy. So okay, you start with the contract and you stick to the contract, but the actual use cases are more like bottom up, and that's what we advocate for the modern integration world. Uh, so traditional SOA, was not very successful because, well, multiple reasons. But one of the biggest problems was the, was the approach that you actually publish your technical resources as the best possible API and then just wait that the world will come and use them. Well, they never came. So be more bottom up with the APIs and integration development nowadays. So you should have the need and start from the need. There should be somebody who wants to use the service and design that service for that use case and then the actual development process uh, um, control with the uh, spec-driven development. That uh, actually lists, uh, so that's the double loop of uh, the actual design and the development of APIs, and actually it lists uh, also the features of our product platform for doing, supporting that uh, lifecycle management. I will leave it for now, because Anton will be doing a live demo, actually, on how to do a banking API with this uh, uh, contract uh, design, mocking services, uh, development, even. Yes, great. So let's do banking APIs. I'll just uh, showcase. So coming back, I went pretty fast, fast through that, but the combining the API-led connectivity and the powerful platform. So actually, we have been building an uh, open banking platform blueprint. So actually, uh, it is a reusable asset in itself. And uh, if you take a look from the very beginning of the PSD2, so basically it's, it names these two use cases, account information and payment initiation. If you take a very simplistic view, it's just those two experience API in Microsoft Lingo, and there's some kind of banking, core banking backend, and it's just uh, connect those. But uh, after my presentation, you should think that that's not the right way to do things because you want flexibility and you want a platform that promotes reuse and, uh, and fast development in the future. So first of all, abstracting your back end. So it could be, for instance, uh, Tevenos T24 connectivity. So abstracting it into, into canonical data model, maybe. So you have your customer, you have your accounts, you have your payments, you have your authorization services, some other back end services. Then in the process APIs, having generic process that you want to in invoke across experiences. And if you do this extra work, which seems uh, at first like extra work, what you will gain in the longer term, well, CMA, for instance, adding there, probably there's not much reusability, but let's believe there's going to be additional use cases. So you want to build this API-driven banking platform. So for sure, you want to connect other parties to your payments, to your account information, etc. So everything else, the reusable services exist already, and you just add 
new channel, new business process, new business experience, user experience on that. Or maybe during time you want to change your banking core system actually. So from your on-prem legacy system to a service provider banking systems or some other vendor or whatever. If you have this abstraction layer of system APIs on top of your backend services, that's not going to be a huge pain. It's going to be a quite big investment in the beginning, but uh, longer term, it will provide you a powerful platform to do this uh, API-driven banking. The Starling Bank was, for instance, uh, talking, and where lots of banks are heading right now. So this is the idea. And this is also the, also the solution blueprint we have been making, and Anton will show an example of, uh, is it uh, account information? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Anton. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, what I do in the company, I do product management for uh, three different things. And uh, one of my favorite things that I'm actually in charge of is to build in the connectivity assets for you guys to actually see the value of the platform, uh, understand how the concepts work, understand how different things work when you actually build those applications using Mule. I do love this part of my job because it's more of like what I do is I'm having fun using Mule. I go to our customers, I go to our prospects, I speak to them, I understand their use cases, and then we're trying to prioritize those concepts, those things through the API like connectivity, connecting multiple systems together. And uh, what I'm gonna be showing to you guys today is the, let me just find the right link. Okay, and what, I, what I'm gonna be showing today is what we ended up with. And as Ada mentioned earlier, we have something that we call any point exchange, which is a catalog of your internal assets. But we also have a public version of the any point exchange where we contribute those projects, those connectivity templates that will help you guys um, get started with MuleSoft. With um, the work that we've done in the last I would say a year and a half, we ended up with a library of this um, 300 plus connectivity templates, connectors, examples that kind of illustrate of what the MuleSoft is all about, right? So we have use cases from connecting one system to the other, from from those use cases to actually building APIs and using like to understand uh, the uh, different technologies. Uh, what I've been working on and my team was working on in the last a um, couple of weeks, we've been working on this accelerator for banking. And the result of this two, um, two weeks job was that we've built and designed uh, three different APIs, right? One for the account information, for payment initiation, and also ATM bank uh, locations. And this is our canonical, it's not a canonical view, but it's more of a kind of a PSD2 API design, and that's how we see it, right? So um, you, can go, you can go ahead to the mulesoft.com um, slash exchange, find those assets, take a look at how we build them. But what I'm gonna be doing today, I'll actually take one of those APIs, I'll show you how you can extend it if you have any additional use cases, how can you actually take that API and implement it to the backend system that you might have. So this is the account information. As you can see um, in the description, it states that uh, this API covers the, uh, the following resources. We have an account information that you can retrieve. You can retrieve account balance and transactions and so on. And under covers, we have uh, this API designer, which is the tool, which is a solution where you can actually go and build that API, right? Um, so just to showcase you a little bit on how the whole thing works, right? So. In API Designer, when you start defining the RAML, you actually like start designing how your API will look like, and this is, will be eventually something that you'll distribute to the, your API consumer for them to actually build solutions on top of it, right? So this is the account information service provider, which, um, you know, applications like, you know, I'm from the United States, we have this application Mint that kind of integrates with a bunch of different banks and retrieves that information to the single application. This is, would be the, uh, the API that me as an API consumer will be using in order to build those experiences for the end customer, right? So as an API provider, I will go to my API designer and I'll actually start defining the, uh, the entities and the um, operations that I can perform over those entities. So let's say I have a, um, a resource called accounts, right? So I can actually go and say like, hey, um, I have a display name for 
uh, this accounts, which is the account information, right? And I have one of the operations that I can perform, which is get. And it also has some description. And then I define the responses that I will get. I'll define the body. And I'll um, actually incorporate the, uh, the JSON schema that will define my data model of that particular API. There's a question. Absolutely, sure. Is it better? Mm. One more? How about that? Yeah, that's what happens when you start diving into code. Um, so is it, is it better? Can you guys see it? Let me just log in into your platform. My session got expired. So what I'm going to do here is first I'll just give you like a really, really quick look on how I can go and um, start actually extending this API, right? So I have these three resources. I have the get operations I can perform over those resources. There's a quick one more. Is it better? Okay. Okay. I'll try to go down here. So what I'm going to do is I'll try to actually take this API and extend it, right? So we have, as I mentioned, we have a resource account. So let's say we have a post operation. I know this is not the available use case for this particular API, but let's say I want to actually go, go ahead and start defining my API. So as an API developer, I'll go into this screen, write to the API designer. I'll say like, hey, right now I want to actually go and um, do the post operation over the same API. So then I will go and I'll be able to start describing this API. And as I'm doing this API design, you can guys see that there is the um, automatic documentation that is generated for you, so there is no need to have a separate documentation, separate API design. Actually, everything is incorporated already into the same API design, right? And you will understand that, you know, similarly, I can follow, um, define the description, then I can go define the, uh, the responses that I'll get, and since we have, what, like 15 minutes for the whole thing, 10 minutes, I'm not gonna dive into the API design specifics, but I would actually, um, try to illustrate here is that we already built this account information service provider API blueprint. I'll actually try to take this API blueprint and implement it to my backend system. So what I will do, I'll just delete this thing really quick that I'll did the uh, the post. I'll save I'll save this API. And I'll go to my other design tool, which is the AnyPoint Studio. And this is a really, really powerful design tool. This is what we use to actually implement things to the back end. Uh, this is the, uh, the ADE, this is the Eclipse based. If you guys ever work with Eclipse, probably you see the familiar, familiar, familiarity. Uh, what I will start with is that I'll first, um, uh, there is a lot of projects that I've been working on and kind of like playing around having fun. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start a new project and I will call this project bank two since I created the bank one yesterday. And I'll start with uh, creating my API which will, uh, which will be reusing this particular API spec that I was just designing, right? So there could be multiple personas involved in two projects. I could be an API designer. Out of here could be an API implementer that will actually take that API design and tie it all to, to the back end. So what I have from my design tools is that for developers, is it readable, not readable? Uh, this is horrible. Just give me a second, I'll try to zoom in. Let's make it as large as possible. Better. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is the AnyPoint Studio, as I mentioned. Um, when I log in and I decided to start from, not from the scratch, right? So I know that there is an API design that was already designed within my enterprise, within my organization. Um, I have this account information API that I will start actually implementing here live and just show you how this, the whole thing works. Um, so one, uh, starting a new project, I use this API to scaffold my, my application. Um, I'll click on finish, and what it pretty much does, it actually takes the RAML file that I'm given as a, as a specification, and it 
defines how my application will look like. So in the uh, in the Mule Studio, we have lots of different components that you can drag and drop. Like we have lots of different um, out of the box connectivity components, transformation messages, lots of exciting things. Right? But uh, in the API design, you first need to scaffold the application where it will sit and listen for the HTTP request to come in. Right. So there could be um, you guys all familiar with REST? You said you were technical. Cole, you still following? Good. Um, so what the AnyPoint Studio does, it actually gets that RAML and it scaffolds it into the application that has those particular methods that I already were defined in my particular API. So let's actually take one of those and you know prioritize it. Let's implement this API. So what I what I was showing you here from the uh, from the portal, right, was was the whole API design. Let me probably open a little bit better um, experience of a developer portal of this particular API. So we can see that we have lots of those resources available, right? And I can actually go and try them out. I can make the API calls. I can get the response. I can see that there is you know, some JSON coming out. But this is the mocking service, right? This is what I did as a, an API designer to provide kind of a visibility for my API consumers so they can have an idea what things that it will be on top of. But this is not, it's not an API implementation, it's not live API, just a mocking service that gives you that data, right? So what I want you to do here in the AnyPoint Studio is to actually implement that API to the backend service and show how simple that could be done. Right? I have only like what, seven minutes left, so let's, let's just do it. Um, Let's try to connect. What I'm going to do here is that I will implement the uh, the implementation for the accounts where I'm going to go get account information through this API. So that what we do, I'll go and search search for a database. Right? I'll remove this payload that gives me the mocking data. I'll put my database, which is again just drag and drop. Right? We have a connectivity asset. Make it really really simple. Um, and I'll go and configure this particular database, which is almost impossible on the screen. Okay, almost there. Stay here with me. Okay, create a new connection. Here it comes. I think this screen is not simply ready for it. Well, that's how you find that the design tools are not made for this particular screen resolution. Okay, here it comes. So, is it still readable? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be reading so you guys have an idea what I'm doing. So here first, I'll select what kind of database I have. Um, yesterday night when we were speaking to Ada, she asked me to do this live demo. So what I did, we have a database running on AWS. I created a separate schema, so then I can use that schema for, uh, for this demo. This is the MySQL database I selected from the list in order to connect. Um, uh, the second step um, in this process connecting to your database, I just need to configure the connection, right? So I need to list my database credentials. Um, I have them here. Please do not take pictures because this is the real database running. Uh, those are whole credentials that I'll be using here. Um, I'll copy paste this database URL, upload the MySQL driver that we are not able to ship because of a, uh, uh, the security compliances. Um, I failed, and the reason why I failed, this is the, uh, the schema that I need to rename. I'll test the connection, and you see that the connection was successfully established, so right now I'm actually connected to my database that is sitting on AWS. So right now I can start having fun and actually you know, building the actual API, not the mocking service. Um, so once I'm connected to my database, uh, it gives me the operations I can perform over over that data source. And you know, one of the reasons, like I probably need to step back and say, like, hey, this is a database that I use for this example, but we can connect to absolutely anything. 
it doesn't really matter if we have a connectivity assets or not. We have 130 plus different connectivity, out of the box connectivity assets, right? So we can connect to Salesforce with our connector that abstracts the complexity, but we do not really care what is on the back end, right? If you tell me like, hey, I have a SOAP API, I have a REST API, I have a Java API, it doesn't really matter. We speak protocols, so you give us that technology, we can connect to it. We have all those components to cover the, those use cases. In my particular case, I'm using database because it was simple to set up. Um, so I select uh, the operation, uh, which is in my case select. I'll do the basic select, yeah, it's kind of readable. Uh, select everything from uh, my accounts bank schema that I set up. And the second component that I'm gonna drag and drop into this particular flow would be the, uh, the MuleSoft uh, data transformation. And one of the really, really cool and powerful things, let me make this bigger, is that while I'm doing my API design and I'm dragging those components, what Mule does, it actually sits on top of those data sources, and I'm not exactly sure how readable that thing is. It can actually sense the data that I have from coming from data sources and gives me the schemas that I can start playing around with. So once I go and drag and drop this transform message that we call, which allows you to do lots of mapping just on demand, um, you can actually see all that data coming live. So there is a data coming live from my database. There is this schema that I already uh, designed in my particular API. So right now, the only thing that I need to do is pretty much just do the mapping, right? So I'm gonna do the mapping of ID to ID, account number to, let's say, IBAN, a type to type, and the currency to currency. And as you can see, like all this mapping is dynamic. It doesn't really matter what payload is coming in, if it's coming in Java, if it's coming in JSON, if it's coming in XML, we do transformation and we do kind of abstract all that complexity. Um, and what I did here, I connected to my data source, I did the mapping to my particular API, so the only thing that I need to do is to actually run this application, and instead of showing you the mock, I can show you the actual implementation of that API, and hopefully this, the whole thing is not gonna fail. Almost there. It's deployed, and so what is happening right now is that I'm running this particular Mule application locally on my computer, and it's implementing all the way to a data source and it gives me that RESTful API that I can connect to. Um, I'm not gonna go to browser because we can actually do those things from the, uh, from the design tools. Um, and I can showcase you the same thing. So this is the mock data that I was getting and showing you before I actually did the implementation. So what I will do, I'll click on try it now. I'll click on get. There's this mule message that went through and just to show you that I'm not faking this the whole thing, let me show you my SQL database, which is this guy here. All right, those are a few tables that I created yesterday night that have this account information. And what is happening right now is this, this Mule application is actually running on my local machine, is connected to your database, and exposing the RESTful API that I can connect to. And the cool thing is that right now it's local, right? But let's say, Right now I want to take this API and actually move it to development or to QA, or you know, probably it's already ready for production. So I can go and pick this Mule app and say, hey, I want to deploy this application to a cloud. And we have our own version of cloud that we called a Cloud Hub, uh, which is built on top of AWS. There's a lot of cool features that we build on top. Uh, but from this design tools, what I can do I can go and deploy this application directly to um, to my uh, my cloud hub. So some just like to give you an idea, like around all is DLC and you know how you can leverage these tools to actually do that. So one of the things first, I can select an environment, right? You do want to have environments when you do uh, the whole software design lifecycle, right? You don't want to go and publish everything to, uh, to production. You want to probably start with the development, and this is the API that I implemented to a particular entity. I can switch a, uh, the environment that I'm gonna be deploying to, and then the things that uh, we also give the, the flexibility is like first, you know, here you can uh, name your application. You can select the runtime 
a particular runtime that actually you know powers the whole application. I can select the worker size. You know, in my case, let's do 0 0.1 worker, and I can also select the the region where I want to deploy that particular application. So it's like literally, if you guys have any security compliances uh, here in IME, and I do know that you have a lot, right, for the data not to travel all the way to the United States, travel back. If you use our Cloud Hub services, you can actually have your data servers to be here, because we, we give you that ability. We have UA Ireland Frankfurt, and this is something that I'm just learning right now. And I can go deploy this application, and this is something that's gonna take probably um, a minute or two, uh, because the AWS is really, really slow on spinning a new worker. But when the whole application is deployed, I have a live API that I just designed in 10, 15 minutes using the tool that talks to my database, and the database could be anything. It could be a mainframe, it could be SOAP service, it could be REST service, whatever, we don't care. We give you tools to build whatever you guys want. And it exposes the RESTful API that you can start distributing to your partners, to your customers, to other API consumers. And how much time do we have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Um, since this thing is going to take a while to actually deploy, uh, including, questions. including questions, okay, uh, this thing is going to take probably a minute to deploy. Um, I'll probably shift to the Q&A, and once this the thing is deployed, I can show you the real API, which is already publicly accessible and available to everyone. Questions? Yeah, one first. Two, two questions. Okay, uh, hi, I'm George Ciberka from Raiffeisen Bank, Romania. Uh, what I wanted to ask is uh, what uh, it's behind those, uh, let's say, icons that uh, all love behind of those connectors. So you have Java implementation behind, yeah. you have it's, uh, a Java application that runs in a standard JVM, do you deploy it in another server? But, or it's a standalone? <laughs> It's a standalone application, from what I understand. Yeah, so the, the whole mule is Java based, right? So you can actually, in design tools here, um, where was my studio? While drag and dropping the whole thing, you can go to the configura uh, configuration XMLs where you configure those components, right? Some of them we give you out of the box. Some of the things you can code the Java and just, you know, reuse them later on. Um, and then once you have the app application, it scaffolds everything like all the binaries in the zip file, which is deployable on, on our Mule runtime, right? And that's something that we have natively supported in, uh, in the Cloud Hub, our version of Cloud. But it could be, we, we do not stick to our particular Cloud. It could be deployed to your Cloud, a hybrid. It could be on-premises, so you can ship it anywhere you would like. Hi. Uh, yeah, my question was around sort of security. So it's impress impressive what you've just done, but um, obviously uh, it was al also perhaps a bit too easy, uh, and we were sort of pretty much exposing data. Uh, I know we filtered the sort of set of columns, but perhaps you know, obviously I wouldn't want any customer to be able to access records belonging to another customer. So kind of, what's the um, sort of hook into? Identity and access management. Yeah, that's a perfect question, and this is something that we currently working on to uh, like all around security uh, to implement a two factor that we uh, have been hearing just a couple of hours ago. Uh, what I did here actually in this particular API, if you guys are really really tech savvy, uh, there is a couple of the security schemas that we already apply for this particular API. So I just commented them out to you know skip the whole security stuff to make this demo appearing and you know simple right but like if I remove the security uh, this comments out of the security schemes and I'm trying to make the same API uh, call to this particular thing it actually goes through the OS2 provider right and anytime when I'm trying to make a request it will redirect me to this particular identity provider that I will be choosing to use so the only thing I did the whole demo without the security validation is because it's simpler and I can make it in 15 minutes, right? But if you want to secure your API, we do have a support, and right now we're actually working on creating this blueprint um, on how we see the security and the PSD2. If you've got any white papers around that, I'm Yeah, we do have white papers. Yeah, we have some. Yeah. 
It's okay for questions? Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. your attention. Enjoy the rest of the API days.